What's going on everyone? Today we've got my Axial SCX-10 III here on the bench. Now we did a live build of this thing as soon as it came out, but since then we've got the body finished, we've done some lighting to it, and just started to kind of feel it around a little bit. We haven't got it out on the rocks yet, but up to this point we've got a pretty good opportunity to kind of feel what this thing is like, how it's set up, and a lot of the features on it. Now the SCX-10 III, if you've interested in it, you've probably seen all of the features, including portal axles, a two-speed transmission with a dig, which is a rear axle disconnect. We'll go over that a little bit later. Then from there, we also have a lot of licensed pieces like the Maxxis tires, the KMC wheels, the Jeep JL Rubicon body, which looks great and has a bunch of hard molded plastic details to it, which really put this thing kind of over the top. Inside of that body, we also have a nice interior with an interior cage. Now the interior cage comes in a gray molded plastic from the factory. When I had this body painted by Suit Scale Painting, he also painted the interior cage for me black so that it kind of blends in. I feel like it's a little bit more of a realistic color uh, to go with this. Now the interior itself is a half depth interior, but it does have a driver figure in there. It's got a front row and a rear row of seats as well as a cargo area. It's not super deep, but it really helps fill this thing out as far as like when you're looking into it from the outside, you don't see down into the chassis, really completes the look nicely. And the addition of the interior cage just helps things out that much better when you start to get up close and really look around. Now, at the time of this video, this truck only comes as a kit. So you'll have to select your own electronics. Now, selecting electronics for a vehicle like this can be a little bit overwhelming if you're new to this or don't know exactly which route you wanna go. You can go either a brushed route or a brushless route. And if you go brushless, you really should be looking at a censored brushless system. But if you wanna go the inexpensive way, you can go with a brushed system and you'll be just fine. If you're picking up a vehicle like this and you're looking for brushed, look at something like a Holmes Hobbies Trailmaster Sport or Crawlmaster Sport motor if you wanna stay in that 20 to $25 range for the motor. Look for either a 27 turn or a 35 turn if you're looking on the Trailmaster side or go for a 13 turn to a 16 turn if you're looking at the Crawlmaster side. If you wanna step up to a little bit nicer motor, you can also look at the rebuildable versions from Holmes, either the Torque Master or the Crawlmaster again in the same or you can also look for like Tekken motors, which they have some rebuildable options as well. And then when you're looking at ESCs, you can look at the Tekken BXR, which is a nice option, or go for something like a Hobbywing 1080. And I'll link to these products in the description below, kind of give you a recommended list of items that you can kind of mix and match from. Then if you wanna to go to the brushless side, Brushless side, there's a ton of options, but there can be a wide variety as far as what may look like it could be a good choice versus what may actually be a good choice. For me personally, I either choose a Tekken RX4 or a Castle Mamba X for the ESC. And then for the motors, I like to either use the Tekken Rock 412 or the Holmes Hobbies Polar Pro. I like to stay somewhere close to 3000 kV with my brushless motors. For this truck, I chose the Holmes Hobbies 2700 kV Polar Pro V2. And this one is actually the stubby version. So it's a little bit shorter overall. Now there's a lot of other brushless systems out there, but what I would steer you away from is anything that's a two pole brushless motor. Those, I just don't like the torque that those have. And I don't feel like that is really what would be the best suited choice for a truck like this. Those are often the ones that you'll find used often in racing or things like that. I don't think that this is the best application for those. And then the other popular option is the Hobbywing Axe systems. Those are ones that I personally don't like at all either and kind of would suggest steering away from. I think that if you go with one of the other options, you're gonna get so much better feel out of your truck overall that you'll just benefit from that in the long run and you'll find yourself having a better driving experience. Next, you're gonna to need to be looking at servos. Now, this truck, if you equip all of the functions, you're gonna need three servos one for the steering, one for the two-speed, and one for the dig. Now for the steering servo in this truck, I went with a Fataba S9177SV. That servo has got a lot of power, but it's kind of my go-to servo in general. I think that the bang for the buck that you get out of that servo is really good. And if you're looking for just kind of a top-end choice, I feel like it's one that you should definitely take a look at. The gears are super strong, it's a waterproof servo, and just overall super reliable. Also the design and the steering servo area of this truck 
can be picky with what steering servos are going to fit properly and give you all of the suspension travel and clearances above it that you actually need. And for that reason, I feel like you need to make sure that whatever servo you're buying, you've confirmed will fit properly. For that reason, that Fataba S9177 that I dropped in here fits perfectly and it's the one that I'm gonna recommend. I haven't tried other ones, so I'm not gonna list those before I'm actually able to confirm that they fit properly. Next, we've got the micro servos. Now I'm using the recommended Spectrum micro servos in this truck. And at this point, all I've done is testing indoors on carpet, but that is a high bite situation. But I have made sure that those servos are shifting properly. And so far, we're having good luck. I've also used these servos in the Axial Capra where I haven't had any problems either. So I feel like these servos are a pretty easy choice. They also come with the bottom half of the servo that you need for the servo saver system that this truck uses in those two areas. Now you can also pick up a separate parts tree if you're looking for a more universal fit for other micro servos. When you're looking at kits with tons of different functions like this, all of these little details can seem a little bit overwhelming, but if you go with parts that you know are going to fit and just work well and have everything that you need, it can be pretty much worry-free. And then assuming that you picked up all of those servos and you have everything that we talked about so far, then you're gonna need a radio to control that. This truck to function with everything we've talked about so far, it needs four available channels. For that reason, I'm using my Fataba 4PM. Now this radio has a ton of features and fits within a pretty reasonable budget for a four channel radio with this type of programming. Now the actual programming of this radio, I'm gonna to move to the very end of this video. So if you need help programming a Fataba radio for this type of use, you can go to the end of this video and I'll timestamp that in the description below. And then with all of the electronics chosen, you'll also need to choose a battery. Now. The Axial SC Extend 3 comes with two battery tray options. One's kind of a rear cross-mounted battery and one is a side-mounted battery tray. Now the cross-mounted battery tray is one that will fit most standard size packs like you know your typical hard case 5,000 milliamp pack. Or if you wanna go with a slightly shorter pack, you can fit that on the side pretty easily. I've chosen to go with the side mounted battery pack and I'm using the Genzace Adventure Series 4300 milliamp 3S LiPo, but it's a 3S high voltage lithium polymer battery. Now you will need a charger capable of charging to those higher voltages, but if you don't, you can charge it to standard voltage and just lose a little bit of the overall capacity. However, the 4300 milliamp pack that I've installed in here is just a perfect size for this thing and it's gonna give us a ton of runtime, but still keep our weight bias a little bit more forward and a little bit lower than using the cross-mounted pack in the rear. But getting onto more of the overall feel of this vehicle so far. Now, of course, this is Axial's first scale truck like this that has portal axles. This has the AR45 axles, which is an offset front pumpkin portal axle in the traditional SCX10 or SCX10-2 width. Overall, the appearance of these axles is much more scale than some of the other options for plastic portal axles. Some of the details used in the molding of the truss and the C-hubs, the diff cover, is more reminiscent of a full-size vehicle than some of the other options. Up front, we have a traditional three-link with panhard suspension. Now, the panhard bar on this is a kind of a funky bent unit to clear around everything and all of the details underneath at the front of this vehicle. All of the links on this truck, except for that link, are a stainless design with a four millimeter thread. The panhard link, however, is a three millimeter thread. So it's the weakest link that you'll find in this suspension setup. Personally, I think that they should have figured out a way to simplify that link to fit a standard four millimeter thread design in there for more strength overall. And then speaking of the panhard, the panhard mount on the driver's side is a separate piece that bolts on, which is a nice change compared to the SCX-10-2 or some other models where the panhard mount is all integrated into the shock tower. And that's likely an area that'll need attention fairly quickly as that any lateral force seen to the front axle is translated through that panhard mount just based on the nature of a three link with panhard suspension. So the likelihood of seeing that piece break is high, but now you'll have an upgrade that's going to most likely be more affordable than if you had to replace the whole unit. 
The front and rear shock towers on this truck are of a completely new design and pretty original as something I haven't really seen in many other vehicles as they're almost a molded plate design that's made to look more realistic and three dimensional just based on the design and molding that is used. And being that it's so thin, it leaves a lot of room between the shock towers specifically in the front to house the servo and the forward and front mounted motor. To take a look at that, we will need to pull the body clips. The body clips are all on the bottom side of the vehicle, which is super nice, gives you a really good looking, clean design. However, being that they are on the underside, it is quite a task to get this body lined up and access the body pins to either remove or replace the body. Like most other Axial kits though, it's got these little molded tabs for the body clips that are just a lifesaver. Without that, it would have been a much bigger hassle. Now, removing the body, you'll see that I've got a pigtail here, and that's because I've installed a custom light kit throughout this vehicle, and we'll touch on that as well. But we're gonna jump back to this forward mounted motor first. Now, up front, we have this kind of faux molded LS engine cover up front. It looks really nice. It's a great custom detail. Now, of course, at this point, you've probably already seen that it is missing one side of the heads and valve cover area, but that's to accommodate for the size changes that could happen with servos, like we mentioned before. There's several 3D printed options already, though, that you can pick up to cover that. So that makes for a pretty easy project to complete if you're concerned about it. But underneath of that molded unit sits the actual motor. Now, like I said, I'm using a Holmes Hobbies Polar Pro in there. Now it is nice to have the motor moved forward. This is a trend that we see pretty much on all of the newest generation trucks. However, like some of the other options as well, it was moved forward, but it was also moved higher. It sits up front next to the servo. So it gets that weight forward, but it also keeps it high. And being that it also has portal axles, it's already gonna have a little bit higher center of gravity. So it's just one more thing to take note of. Being mindful of center of gravity is going to be something that is very important with a truck like this. Being that portal axles are so popular and so common now, it's something that people should really keep in mind. Now, just adding a ton of extra weight to try and counteract that is something that is commonly done, but should be done more sparingly and just being conscious of where you place everything else, I think is the biggest thing I can just really emphasize to you. Adding weight should not be your go-to method to try and get more performance. Because if you add more weight, it means that you have to carry and try and pull up more weight on steep climbs and things like that. It's just not the way to go to get the ultimate performance. Only use it if it's absolutely what is needed and don't go overboard. The motor mounts to the motor plate in a way that is a fixed mesh design. That's also something that's fairly common lately, especially where there's motor and transmission combinations where you can't easily see the mesh of the gear. So you just have to go with this fixed system to get it in there. It's something that isn't always the most comfortable thing because it just feels like you want to set it yourself if you're more experienced, but in this type of case, you just have to bolt it together and drop it in there. But following the drivetrain, just behind this spur gear, we've got a two gear set, which in this case, in the portal version of this truck, is just a one to one gear ratio. Now in the manual, it shows a second gear ratio option. That is for when this truck will have a straight axle version, which is a non-portal version. Now the gear set that will be used with that type of axle has a deeper reduction, a 1.7 to one reduction. So. If you would like this truck to move more slowly, you can easily get the replacement gear set, which includes both sets of those gears, and you can drop that right in. One thing to note on that pair of gears, if you find that you hear your truck clicking excessively, that's something that has been noticed, and what it is, is those two gears, having them put in backwards, not in each other's position, but actually physically backwards. There's a pin slot on each side of those gears. However, one side has a cupped version that fits nicely with the pin. The other version is just a square cut in the back. You want it on the dished version. So if you hear your truck clicking too much, pull the transmission back apart and double check those two gears. It's likely your issue and you'll likely find the fix very simple. Then getting into the two speed. Now two speeds are something that many people like. It's not been something on my list of favorites up to this point though. I personally don't prefer to use two speeds when I use nice brushless motor and ESC combinations like I've got in this truck. 
I just find that a nice brushless system can get me all of that low speed control that I need, as well as push the vehicle as fast as I'm normally looking to drive it. So adding the complexity and servo and taking an extra channel in your radio, just not something I typically find myself desiring. But for the sake of this build, I went ahead and installed it and installed the micro servo and we've got it programmed into our radio to drive around. The ratio difference between first gear and second gear is not that big. So while it is kind of fun to be able to shift gears and go a little bit faster in top gear than first gear, it's not this huge difference that is something so noticeable that I think I personally will keep it in there. But if you think it's something that you'd like, everything's included in the kit, so it's an easy installation. However, if you're really on the fence, look at what it would cost you to install the extra servos, make sure that you have a radio capable of controlling it, and maybe for whatever extra money that was going to cost you to buy those items, maybe if you just applied that to your motor and ESC budget, you could end up with a nicer, higher power system just in that area, and you're gonna get everything you'd like. Continuing to move rearward in the drivetrain, then we get to the dig unit. Now, what a dig mechanism is, is it's a rear driveline disconnect system. And the reason that you want a dig unit is because it allows you to disconnect the power from the rear drive shaft and it allows just the front tires to keep spinning. And if you move to the fully locked rear position, it will actually lock the rear tires completely. Now, in that case, you can turn the front tire sharp and you can almost pivot around a single tire, giving you just the tightest turning radius possible. Another really popular use for it is when climbing. And this may sound counterintuitive, but you can pull up to a ledge, start to climb up, then move the rear axle to the locked position. This will hold the rear tires in place, not allowing it to climb, but you can keep the front tires spinning, letting them work and trying to hunt for traction. And then once you can tell that they really got the traction, you can start to see the sidewall start to wrinkle, or you can actually see it start to try and lift the truck up. At that point, you engage four wheel drive again, and it'll allow the truck to quickly climb up more technical climbs that you wouldn't been able to do otherwise. A dig unit is something that I have in multiple vehicles and it's one of the most powerful tools you can add to a truck like this. Something I definitely highly recommend. Now at the same time, the dig in this truck is decent, but it's not perfect. It doesn't like to unlock from a bound position, which is a little bit of a downside because that is one area where you can really add a lot of performance if it can do that. Now, part of it is, is that this mechanism in this dig unit is all made of plastic as far as the shift linkage area goes. And I think that there's a little bit of flex there, including the servo saver system used with these micro servos. So, so I think that possibly an all aluminum shift mechanism with a servo without a servo saver may really improve the performance of this unit. And I think that there's also likely room to go to a full size servo for the dig, which would probably improve it even further. Now, as I mentioned, I'm running my battery pack on the side. This is a 4,300 milliamp Gen Zace Adventure lithium high volt battery going to give me just great run times. In the rear, I took out the rear mounted battery tray that was back there and I made myself kind of a custom tray where I've got my MyTrick RC DG1 Dragon light kit controller there, as well as my Fataba 2106 GF receiver. Now on this truck, I decided to kind of just go all out with lighting. I added custom amber or orange rock lights, one in each wheel well. I added headlights as well as halo rings in the headlights also, which just adds a little bit extra. And then of course it also has tail lights. Now that does mean that I've got a tether from the body to the chassis. While it is all removable here at the light controller, for me, I just found it easiest to kind of try and make a wire loom that is long enough and controllable enough that I can still move things around without having to worry too uh, too much. This body I did have professionally painted by Suits Scale Painting came out fantastic. I gave him a single reference picture and a color choice. And from there, he did it all. I said, don't send me any pictures, just do what you think would look best. He did a fantastic job. Now it has got kind of a satin finish to the outside, but it's actually painted on the inside. I'm not sure what process he uses to make the finish like this. It doesn't appear to be just a regular flat clear. 
I don't know, either way, I'm impressed. He also added something to all of the plastic parts that mount to the body also to give them a more realistic look. I'm not the person to ask what was done here. If you're interested in having Suits do some work for you, absolutely message him. You can find him through Facebook or Instagram, but I myself am not the one to ask on what color or what process or anything else. Suits even went as far as painting up the driver figure with an orange shirt, a beard reminiscent of something like I'm wearing, and a Vanquish baseball cap. He color matched the dash on the inside just like a full-size JL Rubicon would have, and overall, I just, I couldn't be happier with how this thing looks. Now with all of the lighting, just trying to get everything through this vehicle was difficult. Definitely took me some time to get everything routed and zip tied in place and uh, to the point where I got happy with it. I made a little aluminum bracket in the rear so that I could reach up under the body to get to the actual light switch for the controller. This controller can be also controlled through an auxiliary switch on your radio. Now I'm using a four channel radio here and the, I've already got all four channels tied up. So if you've got a six or a seven channel like a Fataba 7PX, you can add even more function. But for me, not the route that I went. This kit also comes with a light bar. I wasn't looking to add a rooftop light bar, so I went instead with these rock lights. The rock lights that I've got on here are actually just the exact same halos that come for the headlights. I picked up two additional pair and put one pair in the front, one pair in the rear. And that was a pretty easy install, just opening up these holes a little bit to get the halo through there and then feed the wiring out. I chose to go with a Tekken RX4 ESC in this truck. Now the problem was that there really wasn't that much space to mount this RX4 on this side over here where I wanted it. So what I decided to do was remove the waterproof receiver box that was there previously and design up a spacer to space the RX4 up so that it could clear the frame rail. And it also has the bolt pattern that is on the bottom side of the Tekken RX4 and the bolt pattern that's on the rock slider. So I was able to screw the RX4 to my adapter plate and then screw the plate to the rock sliders using all of the existing hardware from that radio receiver box. Super easy, super rigid, and there's no servo tape required. Everything actually just bolts and unbolts. If you'd like to use that, I've already hosted the STL for that file, so you can 3D print it yourself if you're using a Tekken RX4. If you're not using an RX4, but you don't have room for whatever ESC you're trying to use, you can still use that same file that I had and then just use some double-sided tape to mount your ESC onto that plate. It's free to download on Thingiverse and I'll link it in the description below here as well as on my website, harleydesigns.com, where I'll have a page of all of the other downloadable files that I've got to offer. With all of the rock lights and headlights on, I just feel like I've got a really great looking vehicle overall. One other thing that I did have to do to mount these My Trick RC Halo lenses into the factory light buckets and grill that come with this body is that I had to just design up a quick piece to be 3D printed to mount them into that bucket easily. You probably could just glue them in themselves, but I wanted to just make sure that everything was just about perfect. So again, I designed up a quick file to be 3D printed and like the other one, I'll host it for free if you're looking to install something like this on your own SCX-10 III Rubicon. My overall impressions of this truck is that I feel that it looks better than just about anything else in its price point. I think that it's just got a fantastic overall look. It's going to be nice and aggressive. It's got typical Jeep clearances and styling, which I'm a big fan of. Some people won't be, of course. The Nitto tires look great. They're a good size. I personally really like the height and width that they went for in this one. The wheels that come on the truck are a beadlock, but they are all plastic. So it's easy to get the job done to get these tires and wheels mounted and it will also be easy to dismount these tires and mount them to a different set of bead locks that I will of course be doing in the near future. The included wheels are a KMC machete. I like the overall style and I think that the chrome appearance looks pretty good. It's something that you would see somewhat similar to like a machined finish on a wheel like this that's available today. The front bumper is of a CRC design, which is one done by Casey Curry in the full size world. It looks just like one of the options that you can buy from him. Gives you a nice high clearance look, just something that's not going to get in the way, going to give you a nice approach to your front tires. In the rear, we have another CRC bumper and no spare tire. 
Personally, not a big spare tire fan. I feel like it's just a bunch of weight back there. It can oftentimes get in the way, especially when you're running a tire as big as what comes on here. And in the full size world, if you're running tires this big, most of the time you're not running a rear mounted spare. So for me personally, my out of the box impressions of this truck are positive. Something that I really like the just the style looks of and just the overall design. Now, as far as performance goes, I suspect that we'll see performance pretty similar to some of the other trucks that it's going to be competing against like a TRX4 or a Red Cat Gen 8. It's got some things benefiting it and also some things against it. I think that the motor position is one of the higher positions that's available, but we also have some really nice steering. We've got the benefit of really small pumpkins with gears that we know hold up quite well in the center. The portal axle gears are something that we're familiar with from the Axial Capra. The whole outer knuckle on this vehicle is actually the exact same as the Axial Capra. So any options available for that vehicle are going to be found for this one also. This truck doesn't have any overdrive out of the box, but your options would be changing out a ring and pinion gear, either in the front or rear axle, or the portal gears in the front or rear axle, depending on what options are available at the time. I think that installing some overdrive in this vehicle should definitely be one of the things that you look at early to really increase this truck's performance. Rather than jumping right to adding a bunch of weight, that is definitely an area that I would point you to first. So with all of that said, I'm looking forward to getting this thing out on the rock soon, hopefully sometime around dark so that I can really see how these lights look out there on the rocks. But with that guys, thanks for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoy the content. Subscribe if you're not already. Hit the notification bell so you see the videos as soon as they get uploaded. You can go check out my website, harleydesigns.com. You can see if I have any active giveaways or what's going on with the channel with all of the information there as well. So again, thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one. So for anyone who's looking to program a Futaba radio like this for an SCX-102 or anything similar even, we're gonna first gonna just select a new model. I haven't bound a new receiver to this, so none of that information is gonna be correct, but just the program we're gonna go after. We're gonna say that channel three is our two speed and channel four is our dig. So the first thing we need to do is go to menu three and we're gonna to go to trim dial. So we're gonna take this one step at a time. We're gonna go first and we're gonna say DT1 and we're gonna assign that to channel three, which is gonna be our two speed. DT1 on this radio is this top button right here. Now you could choose any of the DT switches or even the button down here on the grip because since it's a two position, you could just hit this one to toggle it. But for the sake of this programming, we're gonna start with this one here. Now we're gonna say DT1 and we're gonna change that until it says channel three. So now that it says channel three under DT1, we're gonna move to the right and that's going to bring up our step information. For a two position switch, we wanna hit the plus button until it says 2P and that just means two position. That's all we need to do. Now that switch is programmed as a two position switch. Now we're not completely done yet, but we're gonna finish the switch programming first. So we're gonna go down to DT2 and we're gonna change that till it says channel four. Now DT2 is this button right here. Now again, we're gonna go to the right and we're gonna go into this information here. Now for a three position switch like a dig, we want this to say 100. So that means it's gonna go from zero, 100% right or 100% left. So if you're at far left and you hit 100, it's gonna go 100 steps, which would mean neutral. And you push it again, 100 steps, you'd be all the way at the right. That's how Fataba programming works. Now we have the switches programmed. On the servo view here, we could hit this button that we programmed as a three position switch. And you can see it moves to three different positions. One is far right, one is the center, and one is far left. Now, if we do the same thing with the top button, we can hit it, it'll go far right or far left. There is no in the middle position. Now that's the basic programming. However, if that's all you did, you would risk burning up your servos. So the first thing that you should do is go in and find the sub trim menu. You're gonna go to that and you would go to channel three and channel four. Now for these, the sub trim is the actual center position of your servo horn. You want to adjust that until it's riding in the center. Now for the two speed, that's not as important, but for the dig, you want to find it at the position where the rear drive shaft spins freely. It doesn't lock towards the rear and it doesn't drive the transmission towards the front. So adjust the center position with that there just by pressing plus 
or minus. Then after that, you'll wanna go to the end point menu. This is kind of the most important part. So for channel three being our two speed, at this, what you wanna do is you wanna decrease these endpoints to say 50%. Then what you wanna do is use the button you programmed and push it, say, forward into the first gear. And then with the car under throttle, the motor spinning the drivetrain, slowly increase the endpoint until you can see that shift fork is no longer allowed to keep moving forward. At that point, stop and usually back off just a couple of steps. And then do the exact same thing for the other side. Increase it until the shift fork stops moving rearward, back it off a couple of stops. At that point, under power, you should be able to drive and shift with that button you programmed. Now, channel four for the dig, you're gonna do the same thing. Decrease those endpoints to say 50%, both up and down. And then again, with the car under power, start with the forward position or the driving position. Increase that end point until the car is in four wheel drive and the shift fork can no longer move forward any further. At that point, back it off two spots. Then go to the locked position. Now with a dig in the locked position, you can, driving it under power doesn't really have an effect. So you need to decrease the position on the end point, but you need to be feeling the rear tires by hand until it gets into that locked position and it's, and it's physically locked. And then watch the shift fork, make sure that it keeps moving. As soon as it stops, back it off two positions. And that's how you would program this radio for either a dig or two speed. And lastly, if you wanted the two speed on a button like this, you would go to the switch menu here. This one is SW2 on a Fataba 4 p.m. like I'm running here. So you would just select SW2 and make it channel three. Currently SW1 on this switch is showed as channel three. And that SW1 is this button here on the side. So after you program SW2 to be channel three, you also need to come down to SW2 here and you need to program that to be alt. That means alternating. That means when you hit it, it stays there and then it'll go back after you hit it again. If you leave it in the normal mode, it just goes there when you're pressing it. And then as soon as you let off, it goes back to the other direction. That's not what you want for a two speed. So leaving, so leave it in alt. Now, if we go to the main screen and we watch channel three, you can see as we hit that button, it's shifting positions. So that's what it takes to program the 4PM. That's gonna be very similar for the 4PV or the 4PK, 7PX. They're all going to program about the same. It's just going to be a difference of how or where the menus actually look, but you're gonna accomplish the steps with the exact same method.